Well, welcome, Dave. You know, uh, and funny in reading this book because expectations and mindset is 80% of of everything right if, and henry ford said it best if you think you can or can't you're correct right and so that means that we need to be putting a lot of our energy to getting our mind right and expectations are a large part of that so uh, could you tell us what got you interested in this topic and why you put the book together I guess you know i'm a science writer um that's my background and you can't really be a science journalist without covering the placebo effect. You know, it's just constantly there in every study you cover. And, um, you know, I'd always been fascinated by that, how actually, you know, recent research shows that the placebo effect can often bring about real objective change. So it's not just about people's moods improving or them kind of trying to please the experimenter. You actually do see some physiological change. So if someone believes they're taking a painkiller, you know, they actually, their brains start producing its own opioids. Um, so that had really fascinated me. But the thing that really made me want to write this book actually was a personal experience. And that was when I was um, going through quite a difficult time in my life. And I um, was given this course of antidepressant pills. Now my doctor, you know, as they're obliged to do, told me about some of the side effects, which include having really bad headaches. And straight away, I started getting these headaches. And, you know, it's quite debilitating. Like I was struggling to, to kind of do my work. Um, but actually, pure coincidence, I was writing an article about a phenomenon that's related to the placebo effect called the nocebo effect. And that's the negative placebo effect, if you will. It's the evil twin. It means that if you expect to become ill, if you expect to have some kind of symptom, um, you do develop that often. And again, it's linked to physiological changes. Now, looking into that article, I found that lots of the headaches that people experience when they're taking all kinds of pills, including antidepressants, are often caused by the nocebo effect. So you can tell that because people who are taking a dummy pill but believing it to be the real drug also experience those headaches. Um, and finding that out was amazing because it, it meant that, you know, I opened my mind to the possibility the pain wasn't inevitable and then the pain vanished. And that just got me so fascinated in how else are our expectations shaping our lives in ways we don't even realize, because that pain to me felt totally real. Um, it didn't, it wasn't imagined, it's not like I was making it up. And so yeah, that kind of got me down this huge rabbit hole. And that eventually, eight years later, became the expectation effect of the book. And what would you say the expectation effect is, if you could just give a quick summary for the audience? Right, yeah. So, I mean, the placebo effect is one type of expectation effect, but um, my definition is that it's the phenomenon where our beliefs create self-fulfilling prophecies through three main but potentially intersecting mechanisms, and they are changes to our perception, changes to our behavior, and changes to our physiology. And that can happen in all areas of life, not just in medicine with the placebo and nocebo effects, but with our reactions to um, exercise to a new diet in education, even how we age can be shaped by expectation effects through these three uh, different mechanisms. And there's a lot of influence on those beliefs, both internal from our own thoughts and feelings, but then external from group and from marketing. So you think about a lot of these pharmaceutical commercials and they'll list these severe side effects and you, they're forced to do it by law. But then oftentimes you think, well, why would I want to take a drug that makes me feel that way? And I'm being externally influenced by marketing and media. So what does the science show us about the internal expectations that are created and then the external from media and other people that we're related to? Yeah, so I mean, the kind of theory behind the expectation effect is um, that the brain is acting as this kind of prediction machine. Um, so it's constantly building these simulations of the world around it. Um, it evolved this way uh, because that's actually a very effective way of um, processing the messy sensory data that we have. So, you know, if you could actually see the patterns of light that are falling on your retina, it would be very different from what you're actually experiencing as you, in your visual consciousness because the brain is doing a lot of slicing and dicing of that data and sometimes filling in uh, blind spots or ambiguities. And, you know, it's doing that through these... Um, simulations. Um, similarly, it's the brain is using these simulations to 
uh, prepare the body for the challenges it's going to face. So that is where the physiological expectation effects come in. Now, when the brain is building these simulations, it's going to draw on you know, all of your life's experiences. Um, whenever you've been in a similar context, it's going to uh, draw on all of those to try to predict what's going to happen next. Um, and that happens with other animals. You know, we know that other animals can experience expectation effects through processes like conditioning. But humans have this, you know, kind of broader capacity for culture. We have things like language, we have symbols. And, you know, symbols are meaningful, words are meaningful, words can bring a um, into mind all of these different associations. And so that's where things like advertising come into, because actually we're immersed in culture and our culture is then shaping our prediction machine and the calculations that it's performing. And I think for a lot of us, it isn't conscious, right? So we aren't aware of this, we haven't studied this, we haven't looked at the science, and we're being pushed and pulled in all these different ways. And oftentimes these expectations can keep us from behaviors or actions that could help us, could improve our life, could allow us to lose the weight, could allow us to have a great workout, could allow us to perform uh, on an athletic front or on a stage or even socially and connecting with other people. So for you, what was that initial breakthrough like when you realized this expectation effect was happening for you internally? And then how did it change the way you approach some of these situations where expectations have been limiting you? Yeah, I mean, it was totally liberating, actually, because I think what comes across really strongly in this research is that we carry about all of these beliefs about ourselves that we just assume are true without really interrogating them. So one for me was assumed I wasn't really good at exercise, like I didn't have sporty genes. And, you know, so when I I was kind of conscientious about going to the gym, like <laughs> I really tried to get fit, but um, it was always quite an ordeal for me. Like my workouts, you know, were really like not pleasant. I didn't enjoy it at all. And I, I didn't make like great progress. Like, I'm sure it was good for my body, but like, um, I didn't feel like I was really getting a lot out of it in terms of like building strength or stamina. Um, but then what the research kind of made me question was, well, was that objectively true? Or is it just because I had bad experiences in gym class at school? And actually, I was like the youngest kid in my year, and I was quite short for my age, but most of the time I was doing physical education lessons. So I was always going to be kind of near the bottom of the um, kind of running order in races. Um, so I started thinking about that. I looked into the research on fitness and, you know, we really do see quite strongly that people's beliefs about their natural fitness can shape the whole experience of a workout. So when people are given sham feedback about the genes they carry, whether they have like a good sporty version of the Kreb1 gene or whether they have the bad couch potato version, that shapes not just their stamina on the treadmill, but also physiological processes like um, how efficient the lungs are at releasing carbon dioxide and bringing in oxygen. And, you know, um, also things like how comfortable you feel subjectively, what your perceived exertion is. Um, and yeah, so then I just kind of started to question those beliefs. I kind of looked into the science and, you know, the science is quite obvious that like, I don't have a disability. I don't have anything like wrong with my body. So I, it's just, I am going to benefit from exercise and I am going to kind of get fitter and stronger. And I did, you know, like it really helped. I managed to reframe some of the sensations I was experiencing too. So whereas in the past when I kind of became breathless on the treadmill, I'd have this kind of negative self-talk, like telling myself that, you know, like, oh, you're a failure, like you're just not cut out for this, like, you know, you're always going to be a slob or whatever. I just kind of tried to reframe that and saw the the breathlessness, the aching, the pains as being like, you know, that is just the experience of exercise, of pushing your body to its current limit and building strength and building stamina is actually a sign of growth. And what the research shows is that when you reframe your feelings in that way, you see the pains that you're going through as a sign of growth. That actually encourages the brain then to produce these endorphins that give you that runner's high. So it actually makes the exercise more pleasant before and afterwards. And that is exactly what I found. So now working out is really one of my favorite things. It couldn't be a bigger transformation for me. I was just talking to our X Factor members uh, yesterday on our group call. And I was discussing this, this very thing and how that belief 
reshaped the way I engaged with the gym. So up through my, uh, through my middle of my 30s, I was working out regularly, but I hated it. I did it begrudgingly. I did it because I knew I had to and that there was benefits for it, but I dragged my ass there every morning. And of course, being there in that attitude, well, I'd fool around with some stuff. I'd do the, the workouts that I knew and I, and I would leave. And of course, I had plateaued because that was my approach and I had used that approach for so long. And it was also around that time that I had got into uh, guys like David Goggins and, and some more belief structuring stuff. And I had gotten it into my head. And I think it was through a, a, a few different people, but the idea and belief that came out of that for me was that, that if I was to sacrifice one hour a day to completely hating life, right? To be at my best uh, physically and mentally, wouldn't that be worth it? And I, and I was like, that, that's a fair deal to, to sacrifice an hour of my day to be at my physical and mental best. And the minute I adopted that idea, how I approached the gym completely changed. Now it wasn't begrudgingly. Now it was an accepted sacrifice and for a certain result. And that I was excited about going into the gym uh, because I liked the return on that investment. And it was, it was just an idea that formulated that just retrained and reframed how I viewed that. And of course, at that point, uh, AJ and I had signed up for a half marathon and I was saying yes to more physical workouts than ever before. And I was excited about uh, all the workouts and uh, but it was that switch. And of course, it just it changed the, the whole way I engaged and thought about it. Yeah, I mean, that's very similar to my experience. And I think there's, like you say, there's different ways that you can reframe this. But I think, you know, what you don't want to do is to go to the gym carrying kind of a sense of shame, maybe with your current performance or resentment, like you were saying, you know, it's much better to frame it as growth as a kind of positive challenge rather than a responsibility. You know, all of these things are very important. Well, the concept that you brought up in the book, you stress, I think is really relevant here because a lot of times the way we frame the physical pain or we frame the discomfort, it could either be the worst thing in the world, it could be a sacrifice, it could be war, I've heard some trainers call it, or it could be growth, it could be progress, it could be fuel to reach that next speed. And oftentimes we believe as a culture that it's really your muscles that are dictating the plateau. It's your performance. We're all performing at our best when in actuality your brain is governing all of these behaviors and keeping you in the state of a safety zone, a comfort zone based on past experiences and not actually allowing your muscles to go to true failure, to sheer exhaust, exhaustion. You're being protected by your mind. And if you can shift the way you view that stress, that pain that you're feeling around working out, you can actually use it to fuel higher levels of performance. Yeah, I mean, that's the leading theory here for why that particular expectation effect works the way it does. And it's because, you know, the brain is a prediction machine. It's really, you know, it's taking care of you and it's trying to prevent you from injuring yourself during your workouts. Um, so it's kind of trying to balance, you know, what it thinks your physical resources are, what it thinks your muscles can take, how much glucose it thinks is going around in your body. And then it's kind of weighing that up against the physical demands that it thinks you're going to face. And it's always going to come in kind of conservative because it doesn't want to reach total exhaustion where you might have a serious kind of breakdown or injury. Um, now, what we're doing with these reframing exercises is we're not, you know, like um, completely moving the dial um, because that would be dangerous if you were like totally over optimistic and your brain's not really going to allow you to do that. But we are just shifting it in the right direction. We're stopping it being so overly conservative and just allowing ourselves to make the most of the resources we do have. And that's why, you know, reframing works, but also sports placebos work, like a lot of sports supplements, um, when they're compared to placebos don't work any better. It's the belief ra um, of that they're going to work rather than the active ingredient that um, tends to be best. So yeah, you know, it's kind of, it is mind over muscle here. It really is the fact that your brain is kind of, um, yeah, it's calling the shots when it comes to exercise. 
And a lot of those feelings that we have around exercise could also happen on the stage, before a job interview, before a networking event. We label it social anxiety or you know, fear of public speaking. And there's a really interesting uh, observation around athletes who view that as a good thing. Like the butterflies mean I'm going to perform at my best and the blood is pumping and I'm ready to release more glucose into my muscles versus those who viewed the butterflies as like, a sign that things are going to go poorly or they're going to fail again or they're really going to struggle. Just that understanding that whatever physiological feeling is coming up for you around the stress response, you can label it in a way that actually allows you to perform better or worse. That's really under your control. Yeah, exactly. But I think we were talking about, you know, advertising of like drug side effects. But actually, I think a lot of the media is selling us this idea that stress is just inherently bad for you, that it's um, dangerous, you know, it's going to give you a heart attack, that it's going to damage your performance. Like if you feel anxious before a talk, you're going to fail, basically. So you have to be super chilled. Um, That's the message that we're receiving. But that doesn't make sense from an evolutionary point of view, like the stress response evolved because it's meant to enhance your performance. Um, (laughs) And right, and it's not like I don't believe that we just have this kind of fight or flight or nothing stress response. It's like, it's, you know, it's got these graduations, like it's a subtle, nuanced thing. And what the research shows is that when you do reframe stress, if you look at it as this kind of meaningful emotion, that's telling you that something is really personally important for you. And then you recognize that those physiological sensations you're having, that the butterflies in your stomach, you know, the racing heart, that they're actually serving a purpose. The racing heart is pumping oxygen to your brain and to your muscles to make sure you've got enough fuel to do the task ahead. If you do that reframing and see the stress as actually being a sign of growth and improvement and being enhancing and energizing, then what you see is you have a healthier stress response. So you don't go full fight or flight. But what you do have is just an enhanced performance. You know, if you're giving a talk, you're kind of focused, but also able to think more freely, more creatively. Uh, you're you're on the ball rather than being kind of so terrified you feel paralyzed. Um, and we see that in all kinds of areas, not just public speaking, not just sports, but even, you know, graduate students taking really tough exams when they reframe their stress in this way and realize that their anxiety can work for them, they perform much better, especially on the types of questions that were going to cause the highest levels of anxiety. So yeah, reframing stress, seeing this potential for you stress is incredibly powerful, in my opinion. Great point, David. And that's exactly why we encourage all of our audience to get their influence index score uh, with us. So they have an understanding of themselves and how far they can go on this journey. And for those of you who are listening to this show right now and want to get that, you can get it at theartofcharm.com slash influence. And one of the big breakthroughs for our clients and our programs is this understanding that those physiological responses that we're talking about, maybe it's sweaty palms, maybe it's an increased heart rate, maybe it's feeling cold all of a sudden because you're sweating. It's not as noticeable to the audience or the, the person you're talking to it is to you. But if all you do is focus on the physiological response, it's very hard for you then to focus on the communication, the talk, being on stage, the interviewer, or the first date. And if you actually realize the other person isn't observing those physiological responses that you're feeling, and you can move beyond being hung up on those physiological responses, you can actually perform better for exactly the reason you said. You're having more blood flowing. You're actually getting more oxygen to your brain. You're harnessing all of your body's resources to perform at your best. But we have to focus on the right thing. We can't focus on the sweatiness or the the breathing that we're feeling or the intense uh, heat that might be coming on us in those moments where we're feeling this response physiologically. And through our video work exercise, we actually show them on video that it's not noticeable. Although they're feeling this intense response internally, it's not noticeable to the audience. We're not observing it at all. In fact, we're observing what they're saying, the way they're communicating, their body language far more than any of those internal signals. And it takes a bit of exposure to those internal signals, I should say, to realize, okay, I can do this. Now I just have to put focus on the areas that are more impactful to the task at hand, the test, the interview, the first date. Yeah, I mean, I've experienced that myself. Um, So I gave a TED talk, a TEDx talk um, last year. And like normally, so through reframing stress, I've 
learn to be quite comfortable with public speaking like I normally quite enjoy it. But there was something about standing on that red dot that I found it was almost because it felt a bit imprisoning that you can't, you can't move very much. And it's anyway, um, you know, I did have a bit of a stress response and I felt like my leg was shaking and I was like, you know, for the first like 30 seconds, I thought, oh God, this is going to be so visible. Like it's going to be terrible. And then, like you said, I was like, well, I just have to accept that like, um, whatever's happening down there, I'm just going to ignore that and try to focus on what I'm saying and communicating my message and, getting that, um, you know, introducing the science of the expectation effect in the best way I could. Um, And, you know, the shaking kind of stopped eventually and, you know, it all went fine. Um, Then I looked back at the video and like what felt like this huge kind of tremor wasn't visible on the clip at all. So, yeah, it was much worse in my head than it was ever going to be in real life. Um, But on the same subject, you know, I've seen some really good research showing that even if people do detect some of these signs of nerves, so even if they can hear a little tremble in your voice or see that your hands are fidgeting a bit more than you might um, than you might want them to, people that it's not just that they're forgiving of that; they actually do see you as being more appealing and likable because it's such a relatable, understandable response to giving a public talk or to going to a job interview. Like people in general, just aren't judging you on those things in the way that we fear, like the reality is rarely as bad as we think it will be. Well, the other thing to go about that is if I'm coming to a TED Talk to hear you speak, I want to hear what you have to say. I'm not narrowing my focus to to look for these signals, right? It's it's about the totality of that experience and and focused on uh, learning something and the growth that comes to that. And if you... If you seem like a normal person that I could connect with, well, even better, that allows me to to focus on what you have to say much more so. If there's any uh, body language that's outside of that, that would draw my attention away from what you have to say. Yeah, exactly. That's what, and you know, I've come, you know, away from some talks and people have said like, you know, especially when I was first starting out with my first book, they were like, I can tell like that you feel a bit nervous, but they were like, you shouldn't be like, we liked you because of that. We actually, you know, we're rooting for you. And like you said, they just wanted to hear what I had to say. And as long as I appeared like I, you know, knew my stuff and that I was not bullshitting them, then they were like, that's what they wanted to come to the talk for. They weren't there for this kind of super slick like performance as if I was some kind of Hollywood actor giving a talk. They were there to hear what I'd learned about, you know, these psychological topics. So along with this, obviously, there's the physiological stress response, but then there's also, for a lot of us, the way we visualize events happening. So you talked a little bit about based on past experiences, this predictive modeling that your brain does. But we can actually use positive visualization to start to shift those expectations. And we've heard about Michael Phelps and his ability to visualize races to the tiniest detail. And of course, all of the feats of glory that he's achieved in his Olympic career. But how does an average person harness this power of visualization? And what does science really tell us around visualization? Because when we talk about it in our coaching programs, some clients raise an eyebrow or two or feel like it might be woo-woo to feel that, oh, I just have to daydream about success or manifest success and then it happens. But the visualization, there is sound science on helping your performance. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so I have to say before I was um, kind of researching and writing my book, I was, you know, a bit like your clients, like um, a little bit skeptical of visualization. I think because we have heard, um, you know, a lot of pseudoscience around that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, I'd say like with all of the expectation effects, it's not like you can just visualize what you want and you don't have to actually put in any real work for it. <laughs> um, sadly, <laughs> I wish yeah. it were. Otherwise. It's called the metaverse. <laughs> <laughs> Right. <laughs> but, um, but you know, that being said, like visualization can help you to capitalize on the other stuff you're doing. And, you know, my favorite example of this, again, is with exercise. What we see is that when people regularly visualize doing an exercise, like lifting um, a heavy table, for example, so people might do that every day for a month, just visualizing it, not actually going to the gym. Um, Now, that's not going to actually build the muscle fibers themselves. But what it does do is change the way the brain plans 
and executes its movements when it's lifting heavy weights. So it's kind of encouraging it maybe to recruit more muscle fibers and to make those movements more efficient to give you the confidence to give the prediction machine the confidence that it can lift heavier weights than you have been doing previously. And that's exactly then what happened at the end when these participants were tested after having done this visualization exercise every day for a month. At the end of that, they were able to lift about 10% heavier weights than they had done previously um, before they'd done the visualization um, exercise. So it's very a very marked effect. Um, now I'd say the best thing obviously is to do both, to kind of go to the gym and combine that with visualization. It's also really useful if you're injured. Um, so there have been studies looking at people who've got their arms in plaster casts and they get them to do this visualization exercise. And what that helps is to maintain the strength in those muscles, even when they're not being used, because it helps the brain to kind of recognize that there's still strength in those limbs and that you can still, once the cast is off, you can still get back to your regular routine um, without having lost all of the progress you've made previously. Now, is there a specific type of visualization that is the most impactful? Yeah, so... um, you could do it in a kind of first person or third person perspective. And what I mean by that is you could kind of really immerse yourself in this visualization as if you are actually doing the exercise right now in your body. Or you could look at it from the outside as if you were like an observer watching you do that. Um, That's not very useful at all. There's no statistically significant benefit to doing that third person fly on the wall visualization. For building strength at least. Um, but there, you know, is really that immersed first person visualization that's the most effective. That's interesting that you should mention that because I, any time that I've ever visualized myself uh, going through any behaviors or, or emotions, I've never thought about it in viewing it in third person. It was always in first person. But I I guess if you told somebody to visualize it, they, they could very well do it in third person and not reap any benefits. Exactly. I mean, there, so actually, weirdly, there are some other benefits to visualizing stuff in the third person, but just not the strength. No, but say, one. if you are getting super stressed about an event, and you keep on thinking about it. So say you are thinking about this talk that's really stressing you out, trying to imagine yourself from the third person in that situation leaves you feeling more detached and can actually reduce the stress response. So there's benefits to both. But I think when you're building strength, you really want the brain to be planning those movements very accurately. And that's best if you're immersed in what you're visualizing. The level of detail that you utilize in the visualization helps tremendously as well. So it's not just, okay, I'm going to think about it for 30 seconds, but it's every syllable of the talk with you on stage. It's you walking in the room for the interview, answering the questions, then exiting the room. And the more that you can harness your ability to visualize as fully as possible that experience, the more benefit you're giving your brain for that future experience and its predictive modeling. Yeah, exactly. You're kind of giving yourself the possibility, I guess, to try out all the different alternative scenarios you might face and then you know it's like it is like a form of rehearsal I guess it's just you're doing it in your mind if you can't actually get to the venue to do it in front of an audience um before the talk itself so yeah as much detail as you can in that circumstance I think is incredibly helpful now we always talk about the impact that our relationships have on our expectations So for many of us, we might be in situations with friends who aren't supportive of us stretching our comfort zone or doing things outside of the norm. And one of our exercises inside our X Factor Accelerator involves going out and stretching your comfort zone by laying on a sidewalk with people passing by. (laughs) Now, to share that exercise with people who aren't familiar with self-development or maybe aren't concerned about growing their confidence in that way They might be very skeptical and say, well, why would you do that? That sounds awful. People are going to point and laugh at you. But inside the group, with members are all doing it together and coming back the next week and talking about how amazing and invigorating they felt having accomplished that and no one reacted negatively to them laying on the ground, it actually creates more impetus for group members to participate and to join in the next week and to get value out of it. So this group expectation is often set by our friends, our family, relationships around us. And and we don't often think about the impact that their expectations are having on our ability to perform and take action in meaningful ways in our life. 
I want to add to that as well. In that exercise, what usually happens, a majority of our clients then, after doing that one exercise, they're like, well, that wasn't so bad. When will that exercise bother me? So then they look for more and more heavier trafficked areas to do the same exercise to figure out what is the, at what point does that anxiety hit and then being able now to attack that and get and use those opportunities to get more and more comfortable uh, being in those social settings and then at that point all of the concepts that we've talked about on this show become very easy to use because now you've navigated your inner critic and the anxiety that 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 was are keeping you from being proficient. Mm, I love that example. Yeah, I'm going to try that myself. <laughs> um, but yeah, I do think, um, like you say, our friends, our family members, it's like people have kind of written a script for us in the way that they think we're going to interact with the world. And it's really difficult for us to escape their script and to kind of take charge of that, to kind of chart our own kind of narrative, if you like. Um, there's a whole ton of research on this, you know, a lot of it from education, looking at teachers' expectations of students. And, you know, teachers should be quite good judges, and often they are of, like, who are the more able students, but they're still biased like everyone else. They come with these assumptions. And then, you know, they transmit those beliefs about someone's ability to that person where it becomes internalized. And it can be, you know, it doesn't have to be someone being actively verbally nasty to a kid or a student or an employee. It can just be like nonverbal cues, like whether you, you know, whether they kind of look distracted and bored when you're speaking or whether they're kind of nodding along. If they give you enough time to finish a thought or whether they're just like, dismissing you instantly and, you know, moving on to another point before you've really had a chance to develop what you were talking about. Um, you know, all of those kind of cues are really important. And what happens is that, you know, when you're treated in that way, you begin to feel that you are not um, an effective agent yourself. So it increases your anxiety, makes you feel, um, you know, less less capable, more demotivated, and then that translates into your performance. Um and that's, you know, that's um, incredibly sad, actually, that when you look at the data, sometimes these teacher effects, you know, it can begin like quite early on, and then it kind of escalates throughout the school, because each, you know, once a kid starts underperforming, then they're kind of, it's going to create the expectation that they're going to always be, you know, kind of lower in the class. Um, so it's a real problem, but there are ways to deal with that. And one of my favorite um, exercises that people have shown can help you to overcome this is called self affirmation, and that is um, again, it sounds a bit kind of you know, new agey, kind of flaky pseudoscience. Um, but it's not like just repeating a mantra like, I'm going to become rich, I'm going to become rich. It's like it's much more about trying to look at the things about yourself that you really know you value, and it doesn't have to be related to the task at hand at all. So if it's, you know, someone worried about their academic performance or public speaking or, you know, work performance, just forget about that and try to focus on the other things you like about yourself. So your sense of humor, how good a, you know, son or daughter you are, um, how caring you are, how creative you are, you know, your music taste, all of these things. And then you kind of list maybe 10, pick one, write a short essay about that in particular, like why that value or that ability is so important for you. And then that's it. You can forget about it. But what that's done is that it's created this sense that you have, a, well, a realisation, in fact, that you have all of these other resources. It helps to increase that self-efficacy that might have been taken away by the other people around you. Um, and so what we see is that in education, for example, that can help these disadvantaged um, groups who are facing that um, stereotype threat and that anxiety, all of that that comes from this, from others' beliefs, it can help them to kind of let go of that anxiety. And so they actually start to perform consistently better when they perform this um, exercise regularly. And I think for a lot of our clients who are into self-development, they might not have friends or family members who are so into this or feel like this is an area that they want to strengthen. And oftentimes they'll feel that the expectations of others will hinder them from sharing or wanting to take action or wanting to stretch their comfort zone. 
And then the flip will happen. They'll join a group like our X Factor Accelerator, be surrounded by people who have removed the expectations of what it would be like to lay on a sidewalk or remove the expectations about what it would be like to use the conversation formula with a stranger and come back the next week feeling like anything's possible in that environment. When you're surrounded by people who are only talking about positive expectations, removing the negative pessimism, self-talk, and expectation setting that are often found in, in social groups or in our community or in our family who could be holding us back. Yeah, that's it. We really want to surround ourselves with those people who are not kind of prejudging what you're capable of. Um, you know, I hope, and in my experience, some people do kind of update their expectations of you. Other people don't. Um, and some people, you know, this is even shown in that research, some people actually react very negatively when you kind of break away from the script. And I don't know, I don't have a good answer for how we kind of deal with those people. But I think if, you know, they're coming from a bad place and then they're trying to, you know, uh, subconsciously maybe, but holding you back, like we need to be really conscious of that effect they're having on us and make a, a kind of sensible decision about how to manage that relationship. I think an important part is determining what side of you you feel comfortable sharing with them, right? And maybe this self-development side is not what you share with them. You share your musical interests or you share your sports that you enjoy with them, but you remove that pessimism or that negative uh, effect that they have on this area of your life where you're really stretching yourself and look for other people, coaches, mentors, or even other participants in coaching programs who are going through those same challenges with positive expectations of growth. And you'll be able to see it's like fertilizer for your growth and your ability to perform in these moments. I think there's an, another aspect to it as well. And there's there's a safety mechanism, but the, the traps that come with setting up expectations and focused on the wrong things. For a lot of people, I think their peer group is an opportunity to measure themselves about what their expectations should be. And or if they're chasing, say, happiness that we certainly, there's a, there's a book by uh, uh, Russ Harris called The Happiness Trap and all about that, which is if you're looking at, if I'm looking at AJ and I'm like, well, AJ's happy, so I, I need to be more like, well, like AJ. And then all of a sudden I hear that AJ is on this self-development kick and he's growing and he's putting himself in these situations to grow. Uh, now I have to follow that and maybe I'm too scared to do that. So I don't want AJ to be doing those things because I want AJ's to be next to me and happy so I can be happy. Right. Yeah. I mean, social comparison is like, you know, one of the number one things that kills joy and life satisfaction. Um, yes. And so I think it's, you know, it's also important for us to recognize that we have this tendency ourselves, like you say. Um, and so I, I think with our own self-development, it can be useful to focus on your own trajectory more than focusing on how you compare to these other people, because you're always going to be able to find someone else who's uh, a bit more successful than you, um, seems to be happier than you, is richer than you, you know, all of those things. Um, and that's not good for your own satisfaction. And I think it can be demotivating with your growth. And we actually see that even with studies of exercise, you know, uh, the kind of um, fitspiration posts on Instagram, like I'm sure they are useful for some people. Um, but for lots of people, actually, they're really demotivating at the gym. And because it, by comparing yourself to someone who maybe has is slightly more toned than you, you know, better abs, like uh, bigger muscles on their legs, or whatever, that negative comparison you're making between yourself and them that then reduces your perceptions of your own physical ability. It actually makes the workout then that, that you do significantly harder and it reduces, like, it kind of damages your mood afterwards. You don't have that run as high. So, yeah, we have to be careful of our own self-comparison to others. And I think, like you say, we should also be conscious of how other people might be perceiving our personal growth and whether we might be having the same effect on them. Now, we've talked a, a lot about discrete performance or specific performance and its ability to, to harness those expectations. But a lot of times, expectations can also deplete our willpower. So things that take a lot of time, training for a long period of time, losing weight over a long period of time requires a level of willpower to stay with it, even when there are plateaus naturally that are happening or gains aren't happening as fast as we like. 
what does science say around expectations and their role in our willpower? And what can we do to harness science to increase our willpower? Yeah, I mean, I was kind of shocked by this research because, um, you know, I'd always really believed the research on ego depletion, uh, which is just the idea that you, your brain has like limited resources to practice self-control after a certain point when those um, resources are diminished it's much harder for you to either stay focused on the task you're doing or to stay committed to your goal. So you you become more impulsive, more distracted, you give into temptation, whatever your goals might be. So it could be, you know, you don't end up going to the gym and you um, sit watching a box set. It could be that you're, you know, you reach for the cookie jar rather than um, kind of sticking to your diet. You know, all of these things. It could be the, like for me, that I'm like always on social media rather than like writing my next book. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I really believe this. There's like when you get fatigued, when you've practiced uh, self-control, um, after a certain point, it's kind of diminished. Um, but the research shows that actually a mindset is, that is the result of a mindset. And actually you have some people who see their willpower as being easily depleted in this way. And that becomes their self-fulfilling prophecy. You have other people who see willpower as being kind of self-enhancing. So it also makes intuitive sense, actually, if you think about it, that you kind of get into the zone with doing the task that you're doing. Like, um, you know, if if I was writing, for example, sometimes I can be really in the zone. And then it actually, once I've got there, it's very easy for me to keep going. It's like um, it becomes self-perpetuating. Um, the same with self-control. You might think that first day of giving up uh, candy is going to be really tough, but then it gets easier after that point because you kind of built up your strength on that first day. Um, so two very different mindsets, both of which can become self-fulfilling prophecies. And actually, most of us probably might have you know, a mixture of the two. We might have one mindset for one type of task, like sticking to a diet, another mindset for another type of task, like exercise or um, kind of avoiding distraction at at the workplace. Um, But the good news is that, you know, whatever mix of mindsets we have, you know, in the situations where we have that depleting, limited mindset, we can, you know, once we're aware of that, we can remind ourselves that that's not necessarily the case. We can remind ourselves of the times when we have actually had this self-perpetuating willpower. And by doing that, we find that actually, you know, we've changed the script again. And we're on this new trajectory where our willpower in that particular area now is enhanced simply by changing our mindset. And what I love about that, we talk a lot about this on the show, you can't think your way into acting, but you can act your way into thinking. And in a lot of these examples, okay, we need to find other situations where we had that mindset and things came together and created that willpower. Well, if you're not experiencing life, if you're not allowing yourself and stretching yourself in various areas, picking up a musical instrument, as well as learning public speaking, as well as reading and listening to all of this content, then you're not going to have those experiences, the action points to draw from to make those mental models for other future activities that you're working on. So we talked a lot about exercise. We've touched a little bit on diet. And one thing that came out in the book was the power of words and language and how it can cue us and frame things in a way that impact our expectations. Is the meal going to be satiating or is it going to feel like it's uh, basically prison food, flavorless, you know, something that I would dread eating versus a diet that I would actually look forward to. So what role do words and language play in our expectations and how can we harness the science to use that to our advantage, whether it is in dieting or reaching some of our other goals? Yeah, I mean, our word, you know, words are incredibly important in the way we frame, you know, all kinds of um, experiences. But, you know, using the example that you kind of started like with food, you know, it can change the way that your body responds to what you're eating. And I found that incredible. If you have a milkshake and you have been told it is this kind of sensible but totally insipid health shake uh, with few calories um, and no, you know, real ice cream, no kind of chocolate flavoring, if you've just been told that it is prison food, then hormonally your body responds to eat to consuming that as if you've eaten nothing as if it contained no calories at all like the um response with uh in your ghrelin which is the hunger hormone 
uh, just barely changes at all. It's like the worst thing if you're dieting uh, for you to consume stuff, but it's actually not helping to satiate you at all. And you're still going to have all of those hormonal signals to seek food. Now, if you have that same milkshake and you're told it's luxurious and decadent and you know, full of like delicious double cream, um, you know, then your body starts treating that as if it's a really satisfying meal. And you see that drop in the hunger hormone ghrelin. So your appetite decreases after you've eaten it in just the way it should do. Um, Now, again, you mentioned earlier that are we conscious of this happening? And we're not really conscious of that happening. Like, I think we consume a lot of food without really considering the associations that we've got with that food, how it's been presented to us. But all of that is incredibly important. And I think in dieting in particular, you know, we can easily think that, like, just forget about flavor, forget about enjoyment. It's all about reducing the calories. But this research shows that's the absolute opposite of what we should be doing. Like the flavor, the enjoyment, the pleasure that we're getting has to be a crucial ingredient in whatever we're eating, even if we're trying to reduce the overall number of calories. And going along with that, it's important to not distract yourself while eating. So you talked about your social media habit. Many of us will be on our phone and mentally checked out while we're eating and very quickly not feel satiated even after having a high caloric meal. And we're also pretty bad judges of whether or not food actually has the right calories because again we're cluing into these words so we'll hear healthy or low fat and all of a sudden we're making expectations about what that's going to taste like if it's going to fill us if actually we're going to feel satiated at the end of that meal all based on the words and the labels of the packaging of the foods we're consuming yeah i mean it's really unfortunate that say people have this um it's called the unhealthy is satisfying intuition. Um, So basically, if a food is simply labeled as being healthy, we assume it has fewer calories, that it's not going to be so satisfying. And that becomes the self-fulfilling prophecy. We assume that if something is, you know, if we're eating a hamburger and chips, that that is going to give us more satisfaction, even if the calorie content is identical. Um, So, you know, if you're on a diet and you're eating like plate of broccoli, a little bit of salmon, you know, you've, we've got this kind of intuitive response that means that we we expect to experience hunger pangs later on, and we do as a result. So overcoming that intuition, educating ourselves about food, about the calorie content, about the nutritional value of what we're eating, and then making sure that, you know, if you're eating those healthy foods, that you're still getting all the pleasure that you would have done from that junk food, you know, that is as essential to Um, the process of dieting as just kind of, you know, trying to cut the calories without really considering like all of those associations. I'm very curious as a writer, you know, outside looking in, it feels like a very daunting task, especially thinking about writing your next book. And then all these thoughts of writer's block and where am I going to get my creativity come to mind. So taking all this great science and lessons you've learned in this last book, How are you harnessing this in your creative process when it comes to writing? What do you do mentally to get yourself prepared for the output that's necessary to create your next book? Hmm. Uh, I think like there's a couple of things that I've um, learned. And I think one that has been really helpful is um, learning how to reframe frustration. Um, Now, a bit like the stress response, I think when we're doing an intellectual task or a creative task, and we, it's not working how we wanted it to. And, you know, we don't understand like um, a knotty concept or, you know, the words just aren't flowing. We can see the frustration as like a sign of failure. And we kind of work that up with this kind of catastrophic thinking process into this kind of worst case scenario where it's like, I always used to be worried. It's like, oh, I've written like one book. It's like, my creativity is probably dried up now and that's it. I'll never write again. Um, I mean, that is such a ridiculous thing to think at like in my mid thirties that like, um, you know, I've already passed this like very shallow peak and that's it. It's downhill ever after. It was ridiculous, but I did used to have that mindset. Um, and so I've just, you know, learning about the science of the expectation effect, I've learned to actually reframe frustration as this positive process. Um, because we know from the, neuroscience and psychology, that frustration is often what we feel just before the breakthrough. It's actually just a sign, like the aches in our muscles when we're working out, it's a sign that we're pushing our brain beyond its comfort zone to grapple with something that is not 
you know, never experienced before. And that is a good thing. And that's the only way that we're going to grow, you know, as writers or in any profession. Um, so that was my main lesson. There's another trap in, in the, the creativity bucket, which is after depleting all of your creativity and pouring it into a project and feeling like that is it, that's the masterpiece. I don't know if I have another one in me. And, and you put that there. If that is really in your soul, you will find yourself with that pen in your hand again or the guitar on your lap again, and you start chipping away. And there's a, another part there as well, which is if you don't continue to strengthen and that creative muscle and push yourself to your creative limits and try to maintain somewhat of a status quo in a, in a certain uh, genre box it, that doesn't allow you to push that creativity – that has a crippling effect on you as as well. Uh, it can almost make you feel depressed. Of like, why am I, why am I trying to create within these these confines when where I want to grow is outside of those confines? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's you know really how I'm trying to kind of frame creativity now and to realize that you know it's not like you have a fixed number of creative thoughts in your head that are kind of kind of, you know, it's not a limited resource that's just going to run down to empty. Like, I actually think with creativity, the more you express yourself, the more you push yourself out of the comfort zone, the more abundant your creativity becomes. And it's recognizing that, that actually, you know, each idea you have can lead to two more ideas. So we, we can afford to be brave with the way we express ourselves rather than, you know, always being living in this state of fear about having a creative block. A lot of those confines come due to the external expectations that we put from that from other people who might be viewing that. But there's a there's another powerful mechanism that is combined with that, which is monetizing that creativity for those people. Where your ideas and where you want to go with that creativity may be nothing that this group of people that you know so well want to pay with, pay for. But what you haven't thought about is the new group of people who are going to be appreciating the strides that you had made to push those boundaries. And, and there's a whole new group of people who are expecting uh, that to, to be moved in, in that manner. And, and that's a new bucket and a new audience and expectations you'll be dealing with. But it'll allow you to be happier and find people who are going to appreciate all of the the striving for new realms of creativity. Yeah, exactly. I think like we often underestimate just how hungry people are for kind of new ideas, 100%. new concepts. So obviously with expectations, I feel the frustration piece, I'm really glad that you highlighted that because it's a mental pain that we will often be the limiter that stops us from moving forward. So for those in our audience who right now might be feeling some frustration in an area of their life, what advice do you have for them who may not be writing to use that frustration, to channel that frustration in a reframe that's more impactful for their growth? I mean, I think this is a very general rule about how you can reframe frustration. But I think the the number one thing is to first recognize, like, why are you feeling frustrated? Like, it's like you're probably frustrated because things aren't working out the way you want. But what's the kind of real source of that? Like, if you can't do what you're doing, like, what happens if you can't do that? Like, what are the consequences? And recognizing that will lead you to recognize like what's really important at the fundamental level of this task that you're doing. I mean, I see that a bit like with public speaking, for instance, like, if I asked myself, like, why was I nervous about public speaking? It was because like I'd written my books and I really wanted to communicate that message to people. And a little bit of me really relished the possibility of doing a great talk, connecting with people, getting that feedback from them, having those conversations. I was almost too scared to admit that, that what I really wanted was to actually be good at it because it can be incredibly rewarding. And so I think that can be something that we often forget. It's like we're not going to feel frustrated or anxious about something that isn't personally meaningful in some ways because we really want something. And recognizing that drive is so fundamental. I love that. Thank you for sharing an, an excellent book. I'm really excited for our audience to dig in, especially when it comes to this idea that there are all of these influences, internal, external, societal, that we actually have control over mentally 
to reframe and move towards our goals in a faster manner. We love asking every guest what their X factor is. What do you think makes you unique and extraordinary, David? I don't know what, I think my curiosity, I guess, is what I think, like, um, that's the thing I'm most proud of, actually, because I really think, especially with these subjects that interest me that I write about, like, I can just take one, like, lead, and it just takes me, like, in places I'd never expected before. And I just love that process. And I think that is kind of maybe what makes my, it, it certainly is like what has fueled my writing. And so, yeah, that's what I'm most proud of. I love that. Thank you for sharing. Where can our audience find out more about the book and all of your work? Um, cool. So uh, people can um, get the book from any good bookshop, I would hope. Um, but um, you can find out more about me and about the uh, the expectation effect of my previous book, The Intelligence Trap, and also read my portfolio on my website, which is www.davidrobson.me. Um, and I'm on Instagram and also I've just started using threads as well. Okay. So um, if people can want to start a conversation, it's um, David A. Robson is my handle. So. Beautiful. Thank you so much, David. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you. Thanks so much. It was a great conversation.